Regeneration, oh such fun. When I say run, run, run. What's that, my boy? Peace and sanity. Sorry, my mustache. Reverse the polarity. Sometimes I'm north, but always a limey, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Jump in the TARDIS, go for a ride. It's bigger on the inside. Exploring all of time and space. Oh, what's that? Exterminate. Cyberman, a Daleks, maybe. Would you like a jelly baby? Time's ticking. We'd best go a new adventure. Geronimo. I am fantastic. So are you? Best come with me. I'm Doctor Who. Welcome to a brand new episode of D4WH. I am one of your hosts, Adam O'Sullivan. Yay! Yay! I love that we did that at the same time. (laughs) Joining me as always is my own cheer squad. It's my other host, (laughs) Nakia Schutt. Oh, Adam, Adam, you're my man. If you can't do it, no one can. Do you like that? I thought you were going to go the Aladdin route. I'm like, if you can't do it, great! No, I would have my new cheer squad. Oh, thank you. How are you? I am doing fantastic. How are you? Good, and I'm glad that you're still speaking to me because I've made you watch another classic episode. So <laughs> well, this was only four episodes, not six episodes. Yeah, that does help. When we when we start talking about the twelve episodes thing, that's mm. when we can start deciding when we don't talk to each other. Listen, you can always like me because I didn't tell you to watch Trial of a Time Lord. Yeah, exactly. There yeah. you go. You've, that's the benchmark. Yeah, it's the benchmark. That's fourteen episodes. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Big shout out to Scott uh, Black. Yeah. Friend of the show. Thank you. Tenuous friend of the show. Mm. Today we are joined by junior comedian, his words not mine, Lenny Whitehead. Lenny. Fantastic to be here. It's great to have you on the show. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming, Lenny. Yeah. We uh, had a conversation, found out he was a Whovian, couldn't miss the opportunity. The second you mentioned Doctor Who around us, it's like, hey, you want to be on the podcast? Yes, yeah, pretty much. I do that now. First of all, we have a podcast, listen to it. Uh, secondly, do you want to be a guest on the podcast? Yeah. 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 So thank you for coming in. You'll notice that you've been chained to the desk and we'll be recording all day. Yeah, don't care how hot it is. I would just like to point out that this is day 693 (laughs) of the Brisbane heatwave. Some call it kidnapping. We call it content, baby. That's right. (laughs) Content. I mean, you're going to cut out all the crying and the pleading he does later, aren't you? No. Beck. Okay. Good. Leave it in. We save that for our outtakes episode. Oh, context. Once we have a Patreon episode, you you too can download the crying and screaming episodes. (laughs) With Lenny. (laughs) With Lenny. (laughs) Lenny's on all of them. We have other guests, but Lenny will be on all of them. He just Help doesn't know me. it yet. Yeah, yeah. Blink twice if you're in trouble. Well, we're your kidnappers, so that didn't work. Yeah, no. Uh, Lenny, do you want to go through your history with Doctor Who? My father's English, so we were brought up on a steady diet of Kenny Everett, Doctor Who, the goodies, um, and things like that. Woo-hoo! Oh, fantastic. I loved Kenny Everett. Uh, who was your first Doctor? I think it was John Pertwee, but the first one I can really, really remember is Tom Baker. Yep. I had a mild break in, in England when the new stuff came out, and, and then it, it just grows on you, and you you start getting back into it and stuff like that. And Especially David's if you're in England, where it's everywhere. Exactly. So what made you have the break from the new stuff? Were you a bit, oh, it won't work, or just busy with life? When you're watching as a kid, it didn't feel like it was made for kids. Mm. But then when you watch as an adult, it then you're kind of going, oh, this is made for kids. Or, yeah. Or, or is it? Yeah, well, kind of family. I mean, we've been picked up because we say it's a kid's show and people say, well, it's a family show. Yeah. So I think there's something for the kids, something for the adults. But, yeah, you're right. When when you watch it as a kid, one, you don't notice the dodgy effects, but two, it does feel like a grown-up show that you suddenly got an opportunity to watch. Although, when was the goodies on in the UK? Were they on at night? Well, I started watching it in Australia, so oh. you come home from school and yeah. if you were lucky to be growing up at the time that, that I did, yeah. then you had the goodies, mm-hmm. then you had Doctor Who. Yes. And then I think at one time you had to choose between Kenny Everett and Doctor Who. So, yeah, it was just that perfect after-school zone out, if you know mm. what I mean. Yeah, it was. And I think Kenny Everett replaced the goodies, I thought, and then Kenny Everett was then replaced by Monkey, but Doctor Who stayed on. Yeah. That's what I, I remember. I remember Monkey. Kenny yeah. Everett sounds like a country singer. I just, oh, no. I didn't want to ask who that was, so I was just like, oh, it must be a country singer. He was a comedian and he would do little skits and have sort of songs. He, he was a very risque comedian and you also got introduced... For kids. 
for yeah. kids, right? Yeah. But you got introduced to music as well th- yeah. with the hot gossip dancers. You had oh, Pink Floyd. You had the whole works. Right. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. He was, he was very, but a bit like the goodies. You didn't know it was rude until you right. watched it later and, and as a grown up and went, oh, that's a bit rude. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you guys are saying that Doctor Who, when you were watching it as kids, felt like it was for adults because mm. this episode that we're doing today was written trying to get more adult viewers in because yeah. they felt that they, they wanted a bigger audience and they felt that the show was too kid, not kid friendly, but aimed towards kids previously and they wanted to get those adult audiences in. Yeah, so these were the, the new showrunner and the, the producer and the um, Bob Holmes, the script editor, and they were trying to make it a little darker. And it's really interesting. I was uh, reading up some, doing a bit of research mm. and uh, someone was saying to both Russell T Davies and Stephen Moffat, you know, how do you feel because Doctor Who keeps stealing material from other shows? And they said, well, Aliens never asked us if they could make a movie based on the Ark in Space. Yes. So the Ark in Space came first. Yeah, and Ridley Scott did work on Doctor Who. Yeah. Back in the 60s. So, so there you go. You know, he, he is aware of Doctor Who. Yeah, although his monster wasn't paper mache, but you know. No, and uh, uh, very phallic symbol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's start, as we always do, with Doctor Who news. Ooh, what have we got this week? What have we got on the desk? Beep, 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 beep. Coming beep, out beep, to you uh, live from... New York. ...recordings. <laughs> this week saw the loss of actor Luke Perry. Oh! Best known for being on Beverly Hills 90210. However, I did some Googling this week and found out that Luke Perry played young child Timothy Lloyd in The Doctor Dances and Yanto's what? young nephew in Children of Earth. A surprising feat for an actor who was around 40 at the time. Wow. No, it turns out that the young pl- actor who played these roles merely has the same name as the famous actor. I thought they weren't allowed to have the same name. Exactly. We he- hear so many stories about famous actors having like to change David their Tennant name. Like David Tennant yeah, having because to. Because of actors we've never heard of. Yeah. And yet for some reason there's a child actor who has the same name as. Luke Perry. Yeah, exactly. Very strange. Very strange. So we've got a question. Were you a 90210? No, no, definitely not. Lenny? Um, yes, I was actually. Yeah. <laughs> I knew of the show, but yeah. It was a little, I was a little older because. Uh, uh, even though all the actors playing it were in their 30s, they were playing teenagers. Yes. So. <laughs> That's the main reason I knew 90210 is because the Simpsons would make jokes about, like, the actors in their 50s playing teenagers. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's what's interesting is that uh, my daughter was quite devastated by it because he's in Riverdale and ah. I didn't, I don't watch Riverdale. So, yeah. Apparently yeah. they halted production of Riverdale for a day yeah, to she, remember him. She sent me a, a morning text, oh, my God, Luke Perry died. He was only in his 50s. He was 52. Very crazy. He was young. Uh, However, Luke Perry does actually have a very tenuous link with Doctor Who. Oh, God. On the TV show community, they have a thinly veiled Doctor Who parody called Inspector Space Time (laughs) that some of the main characters watch. (laughs) It's a recurring joke throughout the series, including when an American pilot is commissioned and retweaked, an obvious joke on the Eighth Doctor and possible American reboot of the series. With the movie. Yeah, exactly. With the romantic, kissy Doctor. Don't kiss me like that, Adam. I'm so sorry. We shouldn't do it on the podcast. (laughs) Later. I I would say uh, we shouldn't tell Dave about it, but he's sitting in the corner watching. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I don't let him listen to these ones. (laughs) In the retweaked US version of Inspector Space Time, Luke Perry plays the main character, now turned into a naval officer, and his companion is an ensign played by Jenny Garth, also from Beverly Hills 90210. Uh I did not know that. I oh, neither did I until I started looking this no. up. No, well, uh, who do you watch? Community, I don't watch Community. No, no, it's a very popular show with the kids, I believe. Yeah, with the kids. <laughs> Listen to us. What are we? A million years old? Didn't you say you were 120? Yeah, yeah. that's right. But not a million. <laughs> You're not a millionaire age. (laughs) That's right. Jenny Garth is dressed in a tennis outfit with a tennis racket framed by (laughs) flashing lights. (laughs) This is is the parody of Doctor Who. In the brief snippet shown on the show, Perry's Inspector Space Time states that they have arrived in San Francisco in the 1960s so that he can have sex with the most beautiful woman, (laughs) who is also his grandfather. Grandfather, wow. (laughs) It was a very progressive show. <laughs> Who is also his grandmother, thus ensuring he will be born. Oh, my God. <laughs> Such a scenario is known as the bootstrap paradox, which is explained by the 12th Doctor in Season 9's Before the Flood. Ah, so explain to me the bootstrap paradox. Oh, my God. Because I, I don't remember that. that. So the bootstrap, oh, my God, do we really want to? No, is, don't okay. do it. Uh, uh, oh. No, no. Don't feel it. Don't do it. Cut it out. I could Cut do a whole out. episode on the bootstrap paradox. <laughs> Talking about actors' names before, like, yeah. were you serious about actors not ha- being able to have the same name? Yeah. yeah well, so when you join Actors' Equity, yeah. if there's someone with the same name, 
name, you can't have it. I think it applies to whether it's politically correct as well, because I don't know if it's an urban myth, hmm. but there was an actor named Penis Track Lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> But I know him. When he, when he joined Equity, they made him change it to Dick Van Dyke. Ah, <laughs> hey, <laughs> ba, ba, ba. Drop that mic. <laughs> I love it. This, you've picked a great guest, by the way. I <laughs> love it. Thank you very love much. Love it already. I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the bootstrap paradox, we might as well record this. Bootstrap right. paradox is content, baby. The bootstrap <laughs> paradox is named after the, the idea of the idiom that the best way to jump over a fence is to grab your bootstraps and throw yourself over. Yeah. So something impossible like you can't ah. so basically the idea is that you go back in time and do something that in that influences something so in the doctor who episode they use beethoven is ah. it beethoven or Ma- mozart i think it's beethoven they talk about a man with a time machine loves mm. beethoven yeah. so he decides i'm going to go back in time i'm going to meet beethoven and to talk about talk about his concertos yes, with him that's right he goes I'm, back in time yeah. Beethoven doesn't exist. No yeah. one's heard of him. So the the guy with the time machine who cannot bear the thought of history not having Beethoven in mm. it writes down all of the concertos himself and publishes them himself. So he has become Beethoven. Yeah. But then who wrote those yeah, concertos who wrote in the them first originally. place? Yeah. Because he re- got them from Beethoven. Yeah. I do remember that. Now I'm thinking I don't remember that. Now. I think the best movie that that nails that is Predestination. Oh yes, and that is based on a, a story by the guy who wrote who who coined the bootstrap paradox because he writes a story called uh, With His Bootstraps or something along, along those lines and that's where the name comes from. But Predestination is based on All You Zombies which is a, a short story, yeah. Oh, oh, wow. There you go. And in in, uh, in By His Bootstraps he, he basically becomes a time traveller, goes to the future and then ends up recruiting himself as a time traveller. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. So, yeah. Yes. And Predestination yes. Is, is quite similar to that, the Ethan Hawke movie, yeah. yeah. Very, very good movie. Recommend you check it out yeah. if you're, you're interested in that sort of thing. I think I've seen bits and pieces of it so I'll have to sit down Watch it. Written, written by Robert Robert Heinlein, that story was. And sponsored by Bubble Wrap. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, this whole episode is sponsored by Bubble Wrap, which had only been around for about 15 years. Okay, so Lenny and I were just saying yeah. we'd never seen Bubble Wrap. So a, as a kid, I didn't didn't realise it was Bubble Wrap, but watching it now, it is so Bubble Wrap. <laughs> yeah, it was really yeah. disappointing. And just before we get to the episode, also very quickly, we know that Bradley Walsh, who plays Graham, is also host of The Chase in the UK. On March 5th, 2019, the Chase aired an episode that included the question, which of these charts acts has the fewest members? The possible answers were The Prodigy, The Pretenders, and The Proclaimers. The Pretenders had four members when they had their first number one hit with Brass and Pocket in 1979. Love that song. The Prodigy had five members when they had their first number one hit with Firestarter in 1996, but they are considered a three-member band because they have three main members. Oh, okay. And The Proclaimers have two band members, not including their backing band. The issue with the question was that on March 5th was also the day that the world found out about the tragic deaths of both Luke Perry, who yeah. I've also mentioned, and Keith Flint, one of the founding members of The of Prodigy. Of The Prodigy, mm-hmm. yeah. It was yeah. a bad day to be a 90s mm. kid, wasn't yeah. it? People were basically like, oh, that's a bit insensitive to air that question. But The Chase is recorded months months yeah. in advance. Pre-recorded. So I think it's just an example of time being wibbly-wobbly. Wibbly-wobbly time, me Yes, me. exactly. Our episode today is The Ark in Space, yeah. Season 12, Story 2. It is comprised of four episodes originally broadcast between January the 25th to February the 15th, 1975. Again, before I was born. It's, uh, yeah, baby. It's um, Tom <laughs> wow. Baker's second. So it's his, oh, really? it's his okay. second, yeah. That's his first series. So he just did Robot and then Ark in Space and mm. then Genesis of the Daleks. Well, there's there's one, there's a two episode story in between these two. The oh, Sontar and oh, something or other. Oh, there is two. Oh, when those, I, when, that's right. When so, I read it, they originally put it in the block as one yeah, episode. Yeah, because she's wearing the same outfit in the Sontaran yeah. one that she's wearing in Genesis. Oh, well, yeah, she about... puts on the raincoat at the end of this one. Yeah. Well, she's met the Sontarans before Sarah because she met them in okay. her very first episode with John Pertwee. Oh, did she start with John Pertwee? Yeah, oh, yeah. I did not know yeah, that. She okay. stowed away in the TARDIS. Well, she was snooping. <laughs> she's a snooper. And they made her walk the plank. Yeah. Is that Dave's motorbike? No, it's a plane. Plane time. We've got the plane going over, ruining the have to line the whole wall. Walls one day. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> With what? Paint? Yeah. Blood? Yeah. Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only green bubble wrap, thank you very much, has to be lit from behind. Everyone knows that blood it really helps the sound from not getting in. Yeah. Or getting out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ch- All right. Well, people start complaining when we chain our guests and they can hear them screaming and crying. <laughs> so if I get the walls lined. And join our Patreon to hear us torture our guests. <laughs> 
hey, do you remember that uh, Doctor Who podcast, <coughs> D4WH? Uh, mm. It was only on for a couple of episodes because they were arrested for torturing their guests. Uh, I know, but John, it was good. <laughs> it was good. I like a snuff podcast. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to our brand new podcast, Snuffcast. <laughs> We promise one person will die every episode. Who will it be? Not me. Yeah. So we don't know who the hosts are every week because the hosts may have been killed yes, last week. But you know they won't. The Ark in Space yes. was directed by Rodney Bennett and written by Robert Holmes, apparently based on a story by John Lucarotti, who was uncredited. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently he submitted a script that was very similar to what ended up being The Ark in Space, oh. but they didn't like it. And then they rewrote reworked it. it. Yeah, and then didn't credit him. Ooh, it's a bit naughty. Mm. The story for features Tom Baker's fourth Doctor and companions Sarah Jane Smith and Harry Sullivan. Oh, it's nice to see Harry again. <laughs> I love Harry. Well, let's let's talk about Harry's actions <laughs> a little bit later in the episode. You can definitely tell this episode was from the 70s. <laughs> and it's not because of the... Bell bottoms Harry's wearing? No, uh, we will talk about it. It's not because the villain looks like a puppet. Uh, the, oh. The Weirin. The Weirin. <laughs> Poor old Noah. Okay, let's start with a short synopsis. Right. The Doctor and his companions arrive on Space Station Nerva, where the last of humanity is in cryonic sp- suspension. However, as the crew starts to wake up, they discover that an alien species is hoping to use the colony to birth a new Weirin race. Can they stop the giant mosquitoes from erasing the final remaining humans? They're not mosquitoes. They look exactly like mosquitoes <laughs> without wings. They look wings. like wasps. Really? What wasps have you seen? Hornets? They're not yellow and black. Anyway, or is humanity doomed at the hands of, ju- uh, of green bubble wrap? Oh, it's very easy to be cynical in... <laughs> <laughs> 20. I will admit they do use the green bubble wrap v- uh, very well, but I it is green did. bubble wrap. Yes. Okay, part one. We see the space station Nerva, which is a beautiful looking space station <laughs> model. Actually, when I watched it, I was like, is that Deep Space Nine? <laughs> and then I looked it up and I was like, oh, yeah, that's why I'm not a Trekkie, because they look nothing alike. No, no. <laughs> it's a bit dodgy. I do understand. I like it. I think it's a really good looking mor- model. But uh, yeah, I mean, it sort of opened and I remember as a kid thinking it was real and it's always disappointing as a grown up going, yeah, it's not. Now, what I didn't catch it the first time I watched it is that they're actually just outside of Earth. Yes. They're sitting just outside of Earth. Yes. Apparently not affected by those solar flares. No, but just far enough. They knew how far to go. Well, well the solar flares are over. Yeah. They would have covered the space station as well. Yeah, that's what I thought. Is, but did you notice that although it was so far in the future, they've still got furniture from last year's IKEA catalog? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everything's made out of wood. <laughs> and you can very like when they move the, the desk along, you can hear it just scraping against. And it's like, well, that's not made out of metal. Otherwise, it would be screeching. Hey, the best thing I saw was the sonic screwdriver was used to undo a screw. <laughs> yes. It didn't have to touch the screw. It just had to be like within the vicinity yeah, of the screw. Yeah. And up it went. <laughs> I, I had a moment then, and it was a pretty impressive screw as well. It yeah. wasn't just your, your run-of-the-mill yeah. Phillips or Stanley. I know. It was one of those stupid ones they give you with Ikea that you can't <laughs> get into something. Oh, you say that you saying the sonic screwdriver is just a big Allen key? Yeah, that is. That actually, I could use it for an Ikea thing, I tell you. That's the modern one. The 13th should have a sonic Allen key. Yeah, but it was just nice to see it do what it was designed to do. Wasn't it designed to just open unlock doors? No, 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 it's a screwdriver. <laughs> yeah, I know it's called a screwdriver. Inside, we see through a green eye as something flips open a sleep pod. We cut away before we find out what happened to the sleeping crew member. I'm sure they're fine. Yeah, I think Dune's fine. I think it's yeah, going to be fine. cool. I love the name in this as well. Dune. Mm, Noah. Noah. Rogan. Noah. Vera. The Doctor. Oh, Vira. Vira, yeah, like virus. Virus. Random crew member who gets killed who <laughs> no one remembers his name. <laughs> yeah, Phil. Phil died early. In the future, the TARDIS appears on Nerva and the Doctor is pissed at Harry for touching the controls. He calls him a ham-fisted idiot. I love that. Well, this, I mean, this makes a lot more sense now that you say that it's Tom Baker's first episode, second yeah. episode as well. Yeah. Because I thought, I thought, oh, this must be Harry's second episode. No, no. Harry came along. So they've just mm. left Unit after the robot. Oh, Harry was part of Unit. That's why he mentioned the Brigadier at the end. Yeah, because ah. he was assigned to... The Doctor had just regenerated and he was assigned to look after him. Oh, because Pertwee, Pertwee was stuck on Earth. Yeah. I forgot Oh, that. well, he, he wasn't at the end there. He was travelling around. Okay. but he was working for the Time Lords. But he was, yeah, working for Unit. Pertwee was working for Unit and Harry works for Unit. He's a surgeon and he was assigned to look after the Doctor after he regenerated. Oh, so he's an actual Doctor. Mm. The Doctor... Oh, God. The Doctor has a doctor. (laughs) Sarah loves him, can't you tell? We will talk about that in a second. I'm ready to talk about that. Well, what do you want to talk about, old girl? Mm. (laughs) 
Harry suggests that the doctor could sell his TARDIS as if he's expecting the doctor to turn around and go, oh, really? I could charge for it. Yeah. I'm on Earth, you know, with this advanced technology that no one's ever seen, and you reckon I could charge money for it? Yeah, well, that's Harry. He's a funny old thing. All right, well, f- we'll screw this place that we're in. We'll go back and we'll yeah. set up a business. Yeah, at Trafalgar Square. What he wants to use it for is a bunch of bobbies yeah. in the middle of Trafalgar Square. Square. Like, what is he planning? Oh, I A flash know. mob? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if Harry knows what they are. He's been at sea a lot. Uh, uh. Mm, He loves (laughs) seamen. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Uh, Classic joke. The doctor notices that the power is off, which means that there's no new oxygen, which means that there's no new oxygen circling. Start the sentence. That there's no oxygen supply. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Thank you. Circulating even. That's the word I was trying to get out, yeah. Sarah, who is holding a lamp with an open flame, remarks how airless the room feels. (laughs) Gee, if only there was some sort of uh, oxygen-stealing flame that they could maybe extinguish, considering that the doctor is holding an electronic torch. Yeah. Which he doesn't turn on. He just uses it to point at things. (laughs) Well, he's a time lord. He can see in the dark and he can breathe, stay alert. Yes. Oh, man. And then Harry touches something. Sarah, being ignored by the men, goes to explore the other room. I love the face she pulls at them. Yeah. I just love that. I always liked that about Sarah. She would always pull faces at the doctor or make fun of him. Is that not what feminists do? They pull faces? Yeah, all the time. All the time. Well, she was a 70s feminist, which is a little different to a feminist now. Uh, I've I've noted that this won't be the last time that Sarah is ignored by men. (laughs) She does spend a lot of time. Yeah, the only the only woman they listen to is the future woman. Vira. They were like, well, if you're a future woman, oh, you must must have some smarts. But if you're stupid like Sarah, Sarah does come across as quite tipsy, like like she's had a glass of wine or two at the beginning of this episode. She kind of does, does. doesn't she? Yeah. (laughs) When she passes out, she doesn't just flat out pass out. She's like, (laughs) woo. Her eyes kind of rolled back yes. a bit and I was like, Ooh. Yes, like she's had a glass of wine and she's watched something on TV that she doesn't agree with. Like, oh, I don't, oh, no. Oh, oh. It is a fantastic dress, though, the, oh, the blue oh, one with the such is a it good strawberries. Dress. Or? Oh. All of her clothes are fantastic. Like, she is so cute. Although I don't like her hair. She's got those flicky things going on with her hair. That was just annoying me. Pat it down, Sarah, pat it down. <laughs> I love the way when they move her up onto the couch, yeah. Harry pulls her dress down. Oh, does he? Yeah, I didn't notice that. Yeah, just this little slight handy make sure. Oh, God. Because I'm thinking, if you're going to cart her around, why put her in a dress? Yeah, because feminists don't wear pants. Oh, don't they? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what the show is thinking. (laughs) Jesus. She was, she was billed as the first really liberated woman's liber companion. And they really push that too, don't they? Yeah, they do. But but they still made her still a little screamy, which... Yeah, I did notice that. You know, particularly in the Ark of the Space, kind of annoyed me. But what's interesting is an interview with her after the Ark in Space, she was thinking of having a bit of a discussion with the producer and saying, look, three in the TARDIS is too much. I think, you know, maybe I might go. Oh. And anyway. Anyway, then they they got rid of Harry, so it just yeah. Was I would her. have suggested get rid of get rid of. I don't like Harry. Oh what? No, I don't like Harry. How can you not like no. Harry? What did Harry ever do to you? We'll talk about it. Oh, all right. <laughs> he's scarred. I think he's scarred. Do you reckon, Lenny? Well, I can see his point. Really, yeah. old girl. Oh. <laughs> you call me old girl again, Adam, and I'll spit in your eye. Well, no. Harry calls everyone old girl, <laughs> even though including the twenty nine yeah. year old Elizabeth Sladen no, and the woman who's probably in her thirties. <laughs> He looks like he's in his 40s, so he should not be going around calling everyone else who's younger than him old girl. I do believe that that's just a turn of phrase from... He doesn't call the men old girl. Oh, no, he doesn't, no, does he? No, he only mm. calls women old girl. Patronising Harry. Very much so. Mm. <laughs> So as the Doctor and Harry argue over when the space station was built, they finally notice that Sarah is missing and she is suffocating in the next room. Yeah. I'm glad they did finally notice because, yeah. you know, Genesis of the Daleks, they didn't notice for quite, yes, I know. quite a while. I love that Harry mentions that he touched a button but swears that nothing happened. If the Doctor had believed him, Sarah Jane would be dead. Yes, yes. Good thing the Doctor's There's a couple of times Harry. in here where it, Harry, Harry's like, oh, it couldn't have been anything. Uh, and if the Doctor was like, okay, yeah. someone would be dead. <laughs> Thankfully, they reach Sarah in time, although now the door closes behind them. Although Sarah has already passed out from lack of oxygen, for some reason the two men are able to move around for a few minutes more. Yes. That room has a lot more oxygen. It does. And then, of course, it's got the hairdryer nozzle yes. circulating. It's the... not a vent. No. Like, you could just stick a sock in that <laughs> yeah, and then you would all be dead. <laughs> or all die. 
Yeah, get that cricket ball out of there. Well, I mean, it's just got a dial on it, and I mm. assume that dial would have an off switch. So mm. you'd just be like, oh, just turn the oxygen off for a bit. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I did laugh at the nozzle. I'm pretty sure they used to have those on old buses, didn't they? It's like a, it's like yeah. a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see the movement that uh, Nakia is doing uh, for the nozzle. It does look a bit phallic and rude. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, Nakia. The oxygen does go into your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> The doctor discovers that some wires have been cut and repairs the wire for the oxygen using the sonic screwdriver. Well, then Harry passes out next to Sarah and then the doctor starts to drop things. They could have all died. Well, they could have all died, but then he works it out. Yes, he works out the right and he turns it on. Uh, they place unconscious Sarah on a table to recover. Mm. The doctor repairs the remaining wires, noting that they have been bitten through with very large teeth, which mm. we later find out our alien baddie doesn't actually have. No. They don't have large teeth. No. They have a mosquito pointer. <laughs> but it could have been the mandibles at the yeah. front. Yeah, true. Pinches. Pinches. Like a crayfish. Yeah, they're exactly like a crayfish, yeah. Yeah. Or an uh, insect. In, yes. <laughs> a highly evolved insect with a set of wire cutters. Got Made a, out of foam. And they've got, a big, they've got a big head. Big right? brain pan, yeah. I think they say. Made the out. doctor loves the size of his brain pan. He does. Gets very excited. The doctor and Harry return to the original room and are attacked by the ship's auto guard, which shoots electricity, frying Harry's shoe. <laughs> Poor Harry. Has no shoes for the whole episode. <laughs> Doesn't seem to bother him. Which I forgot until at, at the end last episode where they're like, he mentions that I, he doesn't have any oh, shoes yeah. anymore. Oh. Well, when he opened one of the caskets or whatever they are where the people are, I yeah. thought he was going to check their shoes out and see if they <laughs> fit in. But I'd been watching Game of Thrones, so ah. I'd just seen the hound take him off a dead guy hanging. Well, he would have had sex with them all and then yeah. killed them. So <laughs> if it was Game of Thrones. Just turn back a bit. Like, yeah. If you're a Tom Baker fan, this episode touches every single little trick that Tom Baker uses. That's a good point. So yeah. he's, he's got his yo-yo. Uh -huh. He's his yo-yo. Yep. As soon as they get the auto guard, both his hat and his trusty scarf yes. Yes. come yep. into play. Yes. How on earth does he pull a cricket ball? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's the doctor and his pockets are always full. <laughs> I don't know where the cricket ball was, but he's got it. Are we sure it came out of his pockets? Well, well we never you know. know. Maybe it was under his armpit is what I Captain meant. Captain Jack was naked and pulled the gun out. <laughs> and is that just a basic car antenna that he carries around? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I thought that's what it was. Or a wireless. Like he, he snapped yeah. it off someone's car while he was walking by. Yeah. I used to love that when I was a kid. You like It would snap off a radio and you just like use it yeah. as a pointer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, and the doctor, you mentioned the yo-yo. The doctor uses the yo-yo. He's not very good at using the yo-yo, is he? Mm. He, like, pumps it once and then it drops and he's like, well, I better, like, yeah. put it up <laughs> again. It's a simple gravity test, Sarah. <laughs> I just let it drop and then uh, I know how yo-yos work, guys. Yeah. I love the way he calls her Sarah Jane. I've forgotten that he called her Sarah Jane. He calls her Sarah sometimes, but I love that he calls her Sarah Jane. I wasn't sure whether to call her Sarah or Sarah Jane, so I alternate within. Yeah, yeah, that's the way to do it. Uh, as you mentioned, the doctor uses his scarf to reach the auto guard being cut off switch, but being organic, it gets zapped by the guard. Now, the doctor mentions that his scarf was knitted by Madame Nostradamus. Mm. Ooh. Never get another one like it. Yes. Uh, Nostradamus had two wives throughout his life. Did he? Really? He had some wild predictions. Yeah. I mean, that's the, yeah. Yeah. He had those predictions where it's like, after it happens, you're like, oh, Nostradamus predicted it. Yeah. Because I can find this link to this link yeah. to this link. To like I can, could leave a prediction saying what? something's going to happen in the future. <laughs> and then you might go, oh my God, Adam predicted it because yeah. he said something was going to happen and it's the future. Yeah. Harry distracts the auto guard with his remaining shoe while a doctor flips the switch, shutting it off. And then they go to try and find Sarah. Yeah, Sarah's missing again. She's gone. They discover that the table Sarah was on is a short-range matter transporter built into it. I'd like a chair like that. Me too. Yeah. Take me to the toilet. When the ads are on, take me to the kitchen and I'll yeah. just get something to eat and come back. <laughs> Especially if you could lie down through the whole process. <laughs> yes. So and what I'm trying to work out is how did she get changed? Something must have changed her. Well, how did she get from that? From a dress into a white ah, this, jumpsuit. For me, this is where this is where the, the vastness of this episode kicks in. Mm, so yes. she, she gets transported from the IKEA catalogue item number 232. Yes. yes. The Slukenhugen. <laughs> Um, into into a kind of a preparation for death. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and, yeah, and you you get you get asked to get ready to make the ultimate sacrifice, mm. and you're you're being talked to by the minister. So mm. this was fascinating. Like she, you thought she was going to die. I yeah, did. I, yeah, I thought she was going to die. I yeah. did too. I thought, hurry up, she's going she's going to die. I was like, oh, how's she going to get out of this? Because yeah. we see her in a later episode. So yeah. Well, she's she's being prepared for cryogenic sleep. Mm. So I think she was materialized into. her 
her new set of clothes. Ah. ah. I'd like that ability too, just to materialise <laughs> set, set of clothes, having, uh, other than having to try and, like, squeeze into a pair of jeans, <laughs> just materialise inside of it. Yes, please. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yes. Never having to try and do up a bra again. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, yeah, I have to do up so many bras, <laughs> even though I have the tits to wear a bra. But anyway... <laughs> Yeah, the man's ear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do they call it on Seinfeld? I don't know. It's called a man's ear or the bro. The bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just going to put on my bro, bro. <laughs> All right, yes. So that that kind of, I thought, well, that's weird. But, yeah. you know, I, no, I accept, I I like accept that. this. And, and that's an Ikea thing. Is Ikea she, like to make life easy. Is she allowed to keep her underwear or do they put materialise her in new underwear Ooh, as what well? What if she gets none? Maybe maybe all of the sleeping people are like freaky like that. They're, they're all going commando. Uh, maybe. He's a commando, but we're all going commando. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. Would you have a use for underwear in the future? Only if you're aggressive. <laughs> if you're... <laughs> Oh, I'm not sure if you noticed this, but like in, in about ten minutes into the episode, yeah. uh, or into where, from where we are now, yeah. that whole concept of everybody on the ark has been genetically chosen, mm. yeah. and any and oh, the, yes. the doctor and his companions are regressives. Yes. They're from the colonies, they That's say. That's true. Only only regressives need underwear. Well, Harry's a regressive. Oh, very much. But so. I love Harry. <laughs> Harry has three layers of underwear on. <laughs> That's how regressive he is. Harry wears white fronts. <laughs> He does. He hundred percent does. He so does. He would have a singlet and Y fronts, yeah. Very sensible. They deduce that Sarah must be nearby, so they start exploring the space station and they find slime trailing into a vent on the floor. Okay, this was a, a little bit of a now as a grown up. Mm. Harry goes, oh, I saw something. The doctor goes, no, 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 it's a yeah. trick of the light. And he goes, no, I saw something over there. And then when you look, there's a big green trail. Yeah. And yeah. I think, why did the doctor not go, oh, yeah, what, near the green trail? Yeah, but there's a, there's a theme throughout the entire episode where he just thinks his companions are stupid. The doctor always thinks his companions are stupid. Harry guesses something and he's like, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, it's love- because of my influence, <laughs> obviously, not because you thought of it. I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> what a prick. I love that line. You can vi- you can visit all of time and space, but you got to do it with a real prick. <laughs> Jesus. I love the way he goes, it's, it's entirely up to my influence, Harry. You should not take any credit for it. Uh, also, we find out later that the slime of the Weirin turns you into a Weirin, and yet the doctor is just touching it all over the place. Yeah. I was actually worried at one point he was going to, like, taste it. Oh. <laughs> I thought he was going to, like, bloop. Oh, oh, well, that's we're in uh, slime. Well, it's a good thing it wasn't Matt Smith or David Tennant because they used to lick things mm. or touch things. Mm. Or, they yeah. would be a we're in in no time. They would be we're in. Do you get we're in? We're, yeah. Oh. When you turn into one, is it? When a- I work too hard, I get we're in. <laughs> I'm very weirened. They find the room that Sarah was in, but she's no longer there. The doctor realises there's a cryogenic section. Oh, yes. And the microfilm archive of all of Earth's history. It should be pointed out that microfilm has a life expectancy of about 500 years. And the doctor Not states that, that the Nerva has been there for thousands of years at least. What, what, where were the USBs? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> where are this the is memory the 70s cards? view of the future, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't store things on uh, digital space. Yeah. Well, that'll never be a thing. Microfilm, yeah. that's the future. That's <laughs> where it's all going. Imagine well, having to go through all of that. Remember those microfish things? Did you yeah. ever see? Oh. But that's the same thing. You get like vertigo as you mm. go through it. Mm. Yeah, Beck's looking at me like I'm nuts because oh she's God. 12. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they didn't do colour either. No. So you've lost. And what about films? Can't have films on microfilm. No. So, obviously, it's a new... You don't know that Mm. in 30,000 years we're not back to the good old microfilm, but it's just better. It's so very sad to think that 30,000 years in the future they're not going to have a record of the greatest film ever made, Saw 5. Oh, yeah, I know. I wonder if they've got any of those classics in there like twilight not even saw one like saw one's the original so i don't know i don't know i've never seen any of them except for saw but i was trying to think it all the twilight films yeah the twilight films oh, yeah no. well don't worry harry will bring misogyny back it'll be fine <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> you don't like harry i do not like harry oh, i loved him as a kid anyway <laughs> They discover the cryogenic chamber, sorry, uh, cryonic chamber, because uh-huh. cryogenics is the name of the field of science that studies very low temperatures. Cryonics is the process of freezing bodies to be revived later. They're yeah. stored at very low temperatures, usually uh, about negative 196 degrees Celsius. Would you do it? Would I do it? Yeah. I, if, if, if I have enough money, I'm 100% doing it. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, they'll Before just... Before I get sick, They'll too. just thaw you out one day and then that you'll just be... 
like part of a uni prank thing. They'll have like the dead Adam on a bench. Or- Fantastic. Wake me up and put me in a zoo in the future. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, I'm down with that. I will be the future's pet. Oh, God. What about you, Lenny? Would you do it? Not if they have to revive me using something that looks like a sprinkler. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I, said, I said it looked like a garlic press with a flower on the end. <laughs> They were the shittest looking medical tools I've ever oh, seen. Oh, in a in a bright green, a bright uh, orange. Yeah. Yeah. Plastic kit. Like, I love that that's what the 70s were like. Well, the future is all plastic. And yet, uh, 20, like 30 years in the future, we're all trying to get rid of plastic. Get rid of plastic, but everything's plastic. Yeah, when she, and that thing, she puts like the crown. Oh. She puts it on the head think, made of tinfoil. I think a quarter of this episode of, of this entire story is just watching people put that thing on and take it off people's heads. <laughs> It just happens so often. And the first time she tries to do it to Sarah, it oh, takes, it it. It it takes her so long to get it on. I know. It's like, could they have not recorded it again? Yeah. Like, you don't have to do Stanley Kubrick and do it 126 <laughs> times, but at least do a second take. I know, I know. I kept thinking she's never going to get it on. Go on, go on, Vira, keep going. I love going. that the entire crew would have been standing there and eventually she gets it on and they would have been like, all right, we got it, let's yeah. move on to the next thing. Keep going. Like, oh, I think I could get it on a little bit quicker. Nah, don't worry about it, let's wrap it up. Uh, although I thought the sets were pretty good. I mean, yeah, I they know. were good-looking sets. I know that, it, you know, the furniture's not, mm. it's it's all very 70s or Ikea, but I, <laughs> yeah, as a kid, Lenny, you thought that you were in a space station, didn't you? You, you thought the Ark was real and yeah. you thought that there was at least... 2,000 chambers there yeah. with, with, with bodies in it, yeah. even though oh, you could yeah. only see level one and two. Yeah, I, I thought that there was like yeah thousands and thousands. I thought there was like 100,000 when I was a kid. All of those people being stored in their plastic moulds. Yeah. <laughs> In styrofoam cutouts. <laughs> but it's good to see obesity had been. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I would not have. I would not have a spot on the ark. That's for sure. You, you had to be a certain size to fit in there, didn't yeah, you? You did. There were a few little shorter ones, but you know, if you you didn't fit that uh, perfect size, mm. I don't know whatever it was, you were out of the ark. Out. And I love. I love that in the seventies they couldn't like edit out background sounds, so you get the sounds of everything. Oh, so when yeah. people are walking out of those those molds, you just yep. hear the styrofoam going. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, couldn't uh, couldn't get around that, could you? <laughs> anyway, what did you think of Vira? What a bitch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she's, uh, hey, she's nicer than Noah. Yeah, well, she's a uh, hard talking. Uh, yeah, I don't know. She's she's fine. She doesn't really seem to have a personality. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. she does. By the end of the, uh, at the end of the episode, yeah. in the beginning, you see her and her brutal diagnosis of can we help Sarah? Mm. Well, she'll either die or she won't. Yeah, 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 yeah. is she important? Yeah. yeah. So she comes across as completely heartless at the beginning mm. and completely distrustful of any of the regressives, the Doctor, mm. Harry, and Sarah. Mm. But by the end, you, you really feel for. I, mm. I did feel for her in the end because she obviously loved Noah and Oh yeah, that came out. When when she opens up the thing and she's like, This is our commander and she's like touching his face. Yeah. I was like, Wow, they better be a couple, otherwise this is we real creepy. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I've been waiting thousands of years for you to come back, Amanda. But uh, you made an observation about uh, Vera when she wakes up. Full face of makeup. Full face of makeup. <laughs> Lenny said to me, full face of makeup. <laughs> Not just that perfect lip gloss yeah. for that lighting. I know. <laughs> Hair looks I love the good. thought of them getting into the arc being like, okay, do your makeup, all yeah. right? Because like, <laughs> you want to look good when you're There's a makeup up. artist there doing everyone's makeup. It's interesting. I didn't really have much of a... I had a really strong memory of Vira, but I didn't have a very strong memory of Noah except as him with the... Turning into, yeah. Turning into a weird... Ugly guy, wasn't he? He, oh. gets, he gets out and I go, oh... Yeah. Seems to be a very seventies guy. Oh, very seventies. Yeah. And... Well, if you were t- if you were doing the casting, mm. you would have said we want someone that looks like they will become a psychopath. Oh, yeah, so that's what true. he looks like to me. Yeah, he does look like a psychopath. Even even before he gets touched by a weir and he shoots mm. the doctor. Yeah. What a yeah, well, dick! That's a, like that's a thing that I thought was going to be explored more. Is that he the whole thing we were talking about before, Lenny? About the regressives. They're regressives, and we are perfect genetic people. Uh, all white, you will notice. Uh, I'm sure that all of the ethnic people are in the other uh, pods, obviously. They're not yeah. all going to be white. Am I right, guys? Uh, yeah. yeah. It is the 70s. Um, but, yeah, like, I thought they were going to explore that idea of we are the genetic perfect people. Yeah, but they didn't. No. It's a, it's a straight-up horror movie, straight-up yeah. alien horror movie, basically. 
Yeah, that it would have been. I mean, the doctor says, you know, all colours, all creeds, mm. but you do only see white people. Yes. As always. Cryonex usually happen at about negative 196 degrees, so you probably shouldn't be touching their bodies. No. Because you would snap off a few fingers. You think that would be a little cooler? <laughs> and he's just, he's just, you know, playing around with their eyelids and checking their eyes and stuff. Oh, you're Harry. Like, yeah, you just snap an eyebrow off. The first, <laughs> the first time Harry opens a pod door, I go... Do you think he should have done that? Yeah. You know, maybe that'll contaminate them or, you know, I've seen The Passenger or Passenger when Chris Pratt wakes up Jennifer Lawrence too oh, early. Well, I mean, that's a problematic movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he picks a woman, wakes her up, uh, and then she falls in love with him. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> that's, um, that's called Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Let, talking about problematic visions of the future, mm. they notice more slime leading to another grill, although how the giant slug is opening and closing these grills is beyond me. Yeah. Because later on they see him go through a grill and they're like, oh, my God, he tore this grill apart. Maybe he's like a little... It's uh, the same grill. Oh, okay. It's the same grill that he All goes right. through, yeah. It's like it's not time for the plot for, it to, for him to destroy it. <laughs> All right, and that's Dune. Poor old Dune. Poor Dune's gone. Dune's gone. Uh, and at the end of part one we see that one in one of the cryonic beds is Sarah. She is passed out. <gasps> oh, no. Dun, 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 dun. Well, well, there's that horror movie style ending. Like, Doctor Who had fantastic endings that made you want to see desperately mm. the next episode. Oh. So doesn't this the first episode end with Harrier opening the cupboard and the... Weirin. The Weirin, the big adult Weirin Falls. falling on him? Yeah, it does. Doesn't the first one... End- no, the first, the first episode ends with them finding Sarah, oh. who's asleep. Ah, yeah. Yeah, they must find the giant thing in the next episode, the second episode. Because I like the way Harry says there must be something we can do and the Doctor goes, oh no. Yeah, the Doctor goes, well, we can't wake her up. She's only just been put under. She'll yeah. be asleep for 30,000 years. And then they, they wake up their Vera and they go, can you wake her up? She's like, yeah, sure, I'll just yeah. wake her up. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just put this ridiculous medical tool on yeah. her head. And you can only, you can only use this me, uh, medical tool with a flower on the end above their pectoral. Um, oh yeah, what was pectoral it? Pectoral muscle. Mm. So that's why I'll, I'll inject her in her wrist. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, wake him up with a gumball. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can you not just get get them to chew on it for a bit? <laughs> Anyway, I thought it, I remember as a kid thinking, "Oh my God, Sarah, no, yeah, no." Yeah, that would that would make me want to watch some mm. some in in some of the episodes that we've watched. The cliffhangers are a little bit naff, yeah. but that's a good cliffhanger. A little bit tacked on, aren't yeah. they? And I can under, but I understand why they do the cliffhanger because, like you said, they want to make you watch the next episode. Because I, I thought this felt like a complete story. Yes, there's not a lot of padding in here. No, there's not a lot of padding. In and fact, by the time we get to the, the last episode, there's a lot of stuff that I wish they had have explored yeah. that they didn't explore, Yeah, you know. It, it really is It's quite pacey mm. for a, for a, an old Doctor Who, I mm. think, yeah. yeah there's, there's not that many captures. No. <laughs> I don't think they get they captured. They don't get captured at all. At all, yeah. No. They get attacked, but they don't ever get captured. Well, yeah. Vera is surprised when shown the body of an a- the alien, even though we fi- find out later that humans have encountered these aliens before. Yeah, but we obviously didn't keep that history because mm. nobody knew. Well, when the Earth was dying uh-huh. or because of solar flares, they had multiple options. Some people stayed in the shelters, uh-huh. some people went out to Andromeda, and, uh-huh. some people went, right. and some people went in the Ark. It's the Andromeda ones that fought with them because they've been there for 30,000 years. Ah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's why right. It's they not in the history. I see. Right. I thought that had happened before the Earth was destroyed. I've always wanted to go to Andromeda. I don't know why. Isn't it in like every sci-fi show don't doesn't it's it? the closest next yeah s- space so, system, so everyone's basically. going to andromeda mm. i mean it takes like several light years to get there so yeah it's where? you're talking about generational ships where were the lost in space people going were they going to andromeda lost in space oh i don't know but they got lost in space so we never yeah know. i know but they were always <laughs> headed somewhere where was it anyway that's going to come to me eventually. no they were just headed to the moon they got real lost on the way <laughs> You just, you just reminded me of Space 1999. Have <laughs> you ever seen that, that show? No, no, I've never seen it. Okay, yeah. a lot of Doctor Who fans, it's they, they also love Space oh. 1999. I'll have to watch mm. it. I thought you meant Land of the Lost. And I was like, oh. no, they don't go into space. And then no. they realise, yeah, Lost yeah. in Space. Lost in Space. And, of course, I'm thinking of the 90s movie with Lacey Chabert in it. Ah, uh, no, I'm thinking of the... Because I had a crush on her when I was growing up. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Until she fun. started doing Christian movies. Anyway. <laughs> oh, don't you hate it? I prefer it when they go into porn. <laughs> or... Uh, I would have preferred it. <laughs> she does Christian movies. Is that like a She genre? did a Christian dating movie where they, it's, it's, uh, it, it was actually funded by the Christian Mingle, Mingle. website. Yeah, well, Christian Mingle. It's called Christian Mingle because you mm. meet other Christians on it. Okay. And they made a movie and the trailer looks terrible. Oh, really? I haven't seen the movie because I'm not subjecting myself to that. <laughs> 
Maybe we'll do it as a Patreon bonus. I didn't know you could have it as a genre. Christian movie. Yeah, I well, knew yeah, there Christian was Christian rock music. And Christian rap and yeah. Christian hardcore. and Christian hardcore. Well, it's just Christian, like, death metal, basically. The green bubble wrap slug opens and crawls into the solar stack, the source of power for the space station. This causes the Doctor to investigate, finding the creature in the stack. Meanwhile, Commander Noah has been resurrected. Yeah, so Noah's a, an arrogant pig. Pratt, yeah. 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 So the Doctor says there's something going on there and he... You could tell why Vera is so in love with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love a guy who's going <laughs> to tell me what to do all the time and <laughs> shoot people I've made friends with recently, you know, that sort of thing. So, so as kids, we used to get into sleeping bags and pretend... That, <laughs> you were wearing... That, that we were wearing the, and, try, oh, that's and, awesome. try to, and try to crawl around because that's all it is. It's, it it's is. just a yeah, sleeping yeah, it's bag a dude, It's a dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's so obvious that it's a yeah. dude now... That it's a dude in a, in a, I don't think I, I probably knew that as a kid, but I, I just used to yeah. go with the it's, flow. It's so funny that we have a, a movies like Alien, which hardly showed the alien, Jaws, which hardly shows Jaws. I think in Alien it was always decided that they weren't going to show much of the alien, but in Jaws they wanted to show a lot more of the shark and then they saw the puppet that they made and mm. they were like, oh, that is terrible, we are not showing that. Yeah. And that's why Jaws is su- such a atmospheric movie because you hardly see the, whereas the BBC were like, bah, Ah, it looks terrible. Who cares? Yeah. Just show it anyway. <laughs> like they could have made it so much more atmospheric if yeah. they had a cut around. And they do try and do that, like the eye at the start. They do. And then the Weirin comes and attacks them and then they yeah. shoot it in the boobs. Did you notice that? <laughs> oh, yes, the pink nipples. Yeah, they yeah, shoot yeah, it yeah. in the boobs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the doctor's like, aim low. <laughs> yes, I love it. Because he's just come out of a Weirin thing and he's like, oh, yes. Is that a way? Is this just me or is it getting really hot in here? Oh. Good God, get those boobies. <laughs> Did they turn the oxygen off again? Because, oh, man, I am suffocating. It, it is a bit odd the way he says, I am lower. <laughs> I'm just sitting there thinking they're just shooting it in the boobs, the <laughs> poor thing. And then when you see the actual Weirin and it just kind of bounces around yeah. and it's six arms like oh, kind of whack into each other and you can just hear the foam like rubbing against I'm itself. I'm thinking of Skippy, you know, when they'd have Skippy <laughs> and they had like kangaroo paws on tongs <laughs> to open things. I mean, they obviously, someone killed a kangaroo yeah. and put its arms on tongs so they could make Skippy. When Noah later on is like, we will be an advanced civilization because we will have all of Earth knowledge it's like how are you going to create yeah. starships by going okay yeah now i'm gonna make it and their arms just bob <laughs> up and down like don't worry i'll get there don't worry i'll get there i have no opposable thumbs <laughs> it's like what do they always say the funniest thing you could imagine is a t-rex making a bed you know because i got those little tiny arms it yeah. would chew the bed up before yeah. i could look for all the knowledge that they would get they're still spindly insects aren't they yeah i still reckon a can of mortain would have got rid of them well they might look <laughs> like that but they're there's a number of shots where those funny arms, which we know couldn't do it, are mm. opening doors, yeah, yeah, yeah. opening yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm yeah. thinking of Skippy with the, <laughs> with the tongs. See a whole episode you of them imagine- just making a starship. like. Mm. <laughs> you imagine the guy who had to use the prong or whatever yes. to try and open them. He's like, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just hook it. Hook it. <laughs> How do we defeat the Weirin? Here, make this Lego set. Oh, my arms can't do it. They can't do it. But they know particle physics now. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. They know particle physics. They just can't do particle physics. (laughs) Oh no, CERN has been burnt, burnt up with the rest of Earth. Oh. Uh, the third person mm. awoken is Libri, right. who looks at Noah and gets terrified. Yes. And then he knows who he is. So why does mm. it. So we just pass it off as sickness from the. Psychic thing. I, I don't know. It's, it's never explained. And why explained. is he psychic? Well, I'm not sure if it was so- psychic. So he's waking up. Yeah. You could argue. It's very flimsy. Mm. But he's waking up, going I'll take through. flimsy. Mm. Going through unconscious to subconscious to oh. conscious. Oh. And in that little bit of subconscious, mm. he's, he saw... A Wirren. Yeah. I think you put more thought into it than the writers did, so... What I'd like to know is why no one says, why have you got your hand in your pocket, Noah? Yeah. I mean, he's just walked around with one it's hand in his pose. pocket. He's a commander. It's a power pose. He could have done a, uh, a Napoleon. Yeah. Popped it up here, whatever. <laughs> Napoleon was probably fondling his nipples at some point. Are you saying Napoleon was a Wirren? Yes. He was slowly turning into a Wirren? No, yes. I, I think it was Napoleon was very, very good at hiding his armies in his sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, you want to see my army? Here you go. I don't know what accent that was. It's my other army. (laughs) One army, two Uh, army. Two armies. (laughs) And I will take over. Oh, no, no, that's German. German. Hello. (laughs) And I will take over. Sack 
Grim Blair. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know French. The only accent I can do is that really broad Australian. That's it. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, it's not it's not offensive if we do our own accent. Well, that's true. That's true. I like that. So I'm going to do it like Katrina for the rest of the podcast. Oh, she'll be right, mate. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Any you, any you. I think we're about to wake up what might be one of my favourite characters in the show. Who? Who? The, the, the next colonist that we wake up. Oh, the one who's whiny. He's whiny yeah. and he's like, oh, he should have stayed on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The guy who's like, oh, it would have been better just to die on Earth. Yeah. Like, oh, Jesus, that is dark. Let's explore that storyline. Is that guy okay? So if you're interviewing um, or if you're writing the role description, yeah. a fatalist whinger. Yes. <laughs> to make it to the perfect genetic match. Yes. I mean, imagine they're going, so what do you think? Oh, I think the Ark's a shit idea. Yeah. We're all going to die. Are you sure I can't just die on Earth? Yeah. All right, you're on the Ark, in you go. In, in, the, in hindsight, I think it's based on a hairstyle. So oh. all, all, three, all three male characters, uh, they have exactly the same hairstyle. They do. Yeah. And we didn't see any of the other women. Maybe they all have short hair, like Vira. Maybe. Maybe. The perfect society is just based on a stylist. Yeah. Which is... <laughs> this is the bizarre. Sassoon Space Station. <laughs> uh, we're Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> and the two colonies will fight each other. I like that. Give us back your hair product, you bitch. Yeah, we're Oscar and Oscar over here. <laughs> wow, we've gone further than yeah. my knowledge of uh, hairstylists. Well, that's where I come into it. Noah places Libri to watch over the Scooby gang, and with the briefest of introductions, the Doctor convinces Libri to turn on Captain Noah. He's yeah. like, you should go shoot Captain Noah. All right, sounds good to me. Of course, he does do that little, where's Dune? I'm Dune, I'm here. Yeah. What? Can't you see me? Oh, yes, that's Noah. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm Dune, no, I'm not Dune, I know I'm not. Weird. What are you? What are you talking about? I would have just shot him there. Really. Yeah. I mean, it's a stun thing. Knock him out. Yeah. Put him back in. I would stun him, but he has perfect hair, so <laughs> I can't. <laughs> He has a very high forehead. Libri holds a, the captain at gunpoint, but Noah grabs the gun back yeah. and stuns him so hard he forms a Jesus pose and falls backwards. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> that, that was like that, that, that's my <laughs> favourite death ever. <laughs> it's so dumb. I love, I love the way that everyone overdies <laughs> in the overacting of the dog, but that guy does that. Oh, what? oh we get to my favourite. Uh, <laughs> this is the end of uh, part two because the Noah pulls his hand out and it's covered in green bubble wrap. Yeah. The start of part three is him overacting the <laughs> shit out of his role. <laughs> As he, like, looks at the hand, he's, like, writhing around. He's like, no, it's trying to take me over, bro. And when he does the, his hand wants to do something and he yes, doesn't yes. want it to. Oh, it's, my it's God. It's like a bad mime. Well, when he was bashing it against the console <laughs> yeah. um, in this, like. I wanted to hear pop. <laughs> well, I think that was the first time that someone showed an addiction to actually oh. popping bubble wrap. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. That's why everyone wants to come wearing. So they're like, I could pop bubble wrap all day. I, I does it grow? Myself. Does it grow back? And then you pop it again. It's like popping zits. <laughs> <laughs> God, I don't want to do it anymore. Oh, which is so much fun on someone else. Will the longest running doctor survive his second ever episode? I think so. Will Adam ever really, really love a classic doctor? Find out next week on D4WH. I just want to know if Harry becomes a new age man. Uh, I don't know. He dies at 42, so <laughs> probably not. No, no, in this episode. No, oh, definitely <laughs> not. Spoilers. So no, you've been up him. Spoilers. He does not. <laughs> He does not all of a sudden by the end of the episode be like, hey, you know what? I probably shouldn't go around talking down to women. <laughs> poor Harry. Oh, yeah, poor Harry. Well, he was just written that way. It's like it's like Jessica Rabbit, I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> well, she did go around uh, degrading women. No, anyway. Um, yeah, she played patty cake with people. D4WH is on Facebook. Give a page a like for updates and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at D4WHpod. We'll post questions and polls and would love your input and feedback. Rate and review us on iTunes, recommend us on Facebook and follow us on Podbean. We are also now available on Spotify and Stitcher. Help us get the word out. Tell your friends about us. And if you see someone on the street wearing a Doctor Who shirt, politely go up to them and suggest our podcast. Thank you so much for being a guest today. Thank it's you been great having so you. much, Thank Lenny. You. It's been awesome. Yeah. Get the word out. You're a guest on D4WH, but when you arrive for the c- recording, they're already recording. What? You peer inside and see that the guest is... You? <gasps> How are you there but here all at the same time? There's only one explanation. Your future self has become evil and come back in time to usurp your position as guest on this podcast. <gasps>
You burst in just as your evil doppelganger sprouts tentacles and tries to destroy you all. You just barely manage to make it out alive, but you end up defeating your future self. Nikia is so overjoyed that she asks you to be the new host of D4WH. Oh, jeez, that was a bit quick. Replacing Adam, who was brutally killed in the attack. <laughs> oh, okay, so I, yes. see, I see the reasoning there. <laughs> I'm not happy that you're brutally killed, but yeah. You know. Thanks. Moving on. Nakia hands you a mop and bucket and tells you that new hosts have to clean up the old hosts <laughs> off the wall before you can record an episode. True. Yeah, hey. So true. That's how I got this yeah. gig. <laughs> Well, you don't want to know who uh, was the ep- who, yeah, I, had to, yeah, who like, I had to kill to get this gig. And am I right? Am I right? Oh. Are you right? Are you right? Uh, listen, I think um, we should uh, vet our guests a little bit better because if any <laughs> of them are going to sprout tentacles, I want to know yeah. fairly early on in the podcast is all I'm saying. Uh, they should tell us so we can make that a feature of the show. Yeah, they should. Please welcome the tentacle monster from Galaxy. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, and you missed a bit of blood in the corner there where the... Other host. Oh, that's evidence. Yeah, yeah, where Jeff died. Poor Jeff. <laughs> I mean, he was a better host than me, but he wasn't as fast as me, so. <laughs> that's exactly right. He was slow. Survival of the stabbiest. <laughs> Here in the podcast world. You are the stabbiest. <laughs> Not the most tentacleist. <laughs> And that's why I like you. And that's why I like you. Until next time, <laughs> keep searching the skies for the Doctor. Goodbye. This has been a production of The, the Nerd, Nerd Infinite. <laughs> and then the sound of dragons spitting fire and stuff. What? Why are you looking at me like that? Beck, take. I'm just dying. Oh. Don't die, Beck. Yeah, please don't die.